My name is Tracy Kowalczyk, and I'm the owner of TK Leadership Outside of the Box, and I'm a chamber member. I'm delighted to be the host for the Powerhouse Series and today's State of the City event. To start off today's event in a positive way, I would like to invite a very special guest to the stage. Please help me welcome Elder Harry Lafond. Well, <clears throat> good afternoon to all of you, and uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, your, uh, your afternoon meal, which guarantees you a nap this afternoon when you get back to the office. Um, <clears throat> I think what I will do is uh, tell you some really bad jokes so that uh, by the time I'm off here, you'll be ready for Mayor Charlie for his comments. <clears throat> For those of you who, uh, who are not quite sure who I am, um, I'm, uh, I'm from Muskeg Lake. I don't, I, don't, I don't live in the city. I live uh, uh, in my home community and have lived there most, most of my adult life, I've raised my children there. The, um, however, all my children have migrated to the city and they now live here, and they, which forces me then to do all my visiting in Saskatoon. <clears throat> I've been involved in a number of different things in my life and, uh, and in, in many ways they, uh, they're always connected in some way to this uh, beautiful city and its uh, many institutions. Uh, I was uh, the uh, I was on council back in the 1980s when they first uh, first started uh, working on uh, indigenizing the city of Saskatoon in a very different way. Muskeg had a dream of becoming becoming part of Saskatoon on the economic side of of Saskatoon's life. And so, through the 80s and through the 90s and into, into the 2000s, this, this has been the overwhelming dream of, of uh, my community. Of, uh, right now, most of them live here in the city of Saskatoon. There's about probably about 1,200 of our members that live and carry on their, their lives uh, in this uh, in this community. And I, I feel that, uh, you know, the state of, of uh, Saskatoon is really tied to its neighbors in many ways. It's, it's a central city that draws people from outlying areas and they come into the city to do their business, to do their shopping, to visit their children, to carry on their professions. And then some of them retreat back to their home communities, feeling the benefit of their encounter here in the city of Saskatoon. That's the way we feel in Muskeg. We've been concerned with reconciliation in Canada. And I feel that Saskatoon and Muskeg have demonstrated how reconciliation can be a success story. We've maintained a very strong connection between the Council of Muskeg Lake and the Council of Saskatoon. And it's something that we treasure and work really hard to keep alive. That has created 
a different feeling towards, uh, towards Saskatoon and towards the people of Saskatoon by Muskeg Lake. That's just one example of how things can, if you do it right, if you do it patiently, if you do it with trust, and you take the time, and you work at it, it can work for you. On the economic side, Muskeg couldn't rub two nickels together in 1985. Okay, and that's, that was our economic uh, situation. Since then, through the hard work and through the cooperation with the city of Saskatoon and through the many partnerships that, that uh, come through uh, organizations such as the, um, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the Muskeg has moved and developed 35 acres of, of, of this beautiful uh, land that we've been given by the Creator. And that 35 acres has given us a new lease on life as an indigenous community, as part of the Cree Nation, to become engaged in a very positive way with uh, not just Saskatoon, but Saskatchewan, Canada, on in doing business. And that's something to be proud of. That's something we need to, to, to work with. And so when, whenever I have conversations with uh, Chief, Char uh, <laughs> Chief Charlie, hey, <laughs> just promoted him. <laughs> but Mayor, Mayor Charlie is, uh, you know, those are the thoughts that we, we share together and he's influenced my way of thinking about the city, and I hope that I, I've influenced him as well in, in understanding the indigenous thinking, the indigenous worldview, the Cree way of seeing business uh, that works, that works for us, works for Saskatoon, and it works, and it works in establishing a future for our children and grandchildren. It, uh, it, it provides a vehicle for us to express uh, a pride in being part of this community in a very active and productive way. And one other item that I would like to uh, share with you in terms of uh, working with, uh, with the city is that we've, we've, taken, uh, we've taken a look at the way business is done in indigenous communities. And it's, a, it's a using the circle as, as another option, another model for holding dialogue and conversation. And how does that complement the boardroom circle? And that's important. That's, that's, that's celebrating diversity. And, it, and I'm, I have to tell you that the first time we sat in that circle with, with some of the mayors from across Canada to, to discuss reconciliation, it was a very different conversation because it came from here. The circle drew out the, the feelings and the, and the emotions from here. And it only migrated up here much later when they got home. That's the kind of work that's really important in a place like Saskatoon where you have a very diverse community, but also a very, very uh, large population of indigenous people seeking the same thing everybody else does, a place to live with dignity, to live with, uh, uh, with a sense of, of engagement with their community, and a place where they feel that their children will have a future for them. 
that's important work. That's important work that it's like making lots of money at the same time, okay? <clears throat> so with those thoughts, I, I just wanted to give you some thoughts to carry away from here that uh, Saskatoon is a special place. Saskatoon has always been a special place. It's a city of bridges. It's uh, it's been the center of Saskatchewan. Uh, it's even better than Regina. <laughs> and uh, it's got it's got the rush, and it's got uh, the rattlers, and it's got unfortunately the blades are still in mourning, but it's got the blades, you know. It's and lacrosse. Oh, I love lacrosse. It's so violent. <laughs> but Saskatoon, for me and my family, is home, away from home, because Muskeg will always be their home. But they've made, it, they've made it a place where they're raising their children now. It's a special place. It's a place where the Dakota people work together with the, with the original settlers of, uh, uh, of, uh, from the east to set, uh, to set up and nurture Saskatoon into what it is today. So thank you very much for giving me uh, a few moments here to, to share some thoughts. And uh, I'll leave the best part to Mayor Charlie, and I'm sure I'm sure he's uh, got some really interesting stories to, uh, to, to share with you uh, and his vision of where we're at today and where we're going to be when he's not mayor. Thank you. Great. Would you just remain for a moment? Thank you, Harry, for that lovely message of how important bringing communities can, can be together and uh, successfully as well. We'd like to uh, present you with a gift to thank you for coming to speak to here today, a gift of tobacco. On that note, I want to acknowledge that we are having our lunch today on Treaty 6 land in the homeland of the Métis. So it's great to see so many people here today. Um, I want to take a moment to acknowledge some uh, important people here today. And please bear with me, it's quite a list. Uh, first of all, our chamber board members, Joe Gill, newly appointed board chair, Tammy Sweeney, Louis Osson, Steph Klovchek, Trevor Jasek, Tannis Taylor, Todd Antil, Tyler Case, Kimberly Evans, Wanda Waldner, Joel Peterson, Claire Marentet, and Jessica Yasishin. Thank you for your service on this board. And we also have past chairs here present who have served us in the past. Kelly Bodie, Marcel de la Gorgendier, hope I didn't pronounce that incorrectly, and Colton Wiegers um, with crutches somewhere here. This, trying to hang on. So thank you again for your past service. And our city councillors, Cynthia Block, Darren Hill, Hillary Goff, Troy Davies, Serena Gersher, Randy Donauer, Zach Jeffries, Marin Lowen, David Curtin, Bev Dubois. <laughs> Minister Gordon Wyant is here to join us today, as well as the Reeve of the RM of Corman Park, Judy Harwood. And a few other special guests here today, Mayor Clark's wife, Sarah, and <laughs> Mayor Clark's mother-in-law, Louise, and father-in-law is not feeling well today, so in his place, Auntie Elma Weeb came. 
And we have another special guest, a famous singer, Sherry Ulrich, that joined the table as well. It feels good to be in a room with so many important people like this. Wow. So this event is made possible by the generosity of our presenting sponsor, BHP, and powerhouse series sponsors, Campotex, Sask Polytechnic, Graham Construction, Nutrien, and Saskatchewan Blue Cross. Thank you to you all. So I'm about to uh, invite someone up here, um, uh, someone from BHP. Her name is Karina Gestelink. I think I said that right. Karina, Asset President Potash to join us to give a welcome and intru uh, introduce his worship. Karina joined BHP in 2021 as Vice President Strategy and Market Intelligence, and she was appointed Asset President, President Potash in late 2023. She was responsible for the delivery and ongoing operations of the company's new Potash business in Saskatchewan. Please help me welcome Karina Gestelink. Thank you, Tracy, for the kind introduction. Um, as mentioned, I am Karina Gisteling, Asset President uh, for BHP Potash, and very, very happy to be here today and to feel the energy of this vibrant city in the room. Anin Tansi, bon après-midi à tous et à toutes. I would like to thank, first and foremost, Elder Harry Lafont for his land acknowledgement and for his wise words on how to get reconciliation right. I know the history of this country has not always gotten it right, and your encouraging words about what has happened here in, in Saskatoon uh, certainly gives us the hope that we stand on the shoulder of yourself, a giant, and, and Mayor Ch Charlie to build on that history and to get it right from um, now onwards as well. I also liked how you called um, Saskatoon home away from home, because that very much is the same for me for me who moved here uh, six months ago with my family, but also for BHP. BHP may have arrived here as a stranger uh, about a decade ago, but we have also come to call home Saskatoon, the great city of Saskatoon. Today, our Canadian headquarters are located right here in Saskatoon. Our office here, just down two blocks from here, has grown to 240 employees, with many of our staff born and raised here, and other employees from around the world, like myself, who've now called Saskatoon home away from home. I've moved to this build, beautiful city last November, and we've absolutely loved exploring this beautiful province. In our time here, we've ice fished at Tobin Lake. I haven't been to Muskeg Lake yet, but I'll, uh, I'll make a visit too. We have become huge hockey fans, go Blades, although we are in mourning. Um, not for too long, hopefully. And we have taken many long drives to explore the beautiful area and the most beautiful sunsets of the whole planet. As a family, we've been so grateful for how warm and welcoming everyone has been. So to everyone in this room today, from my family to yours, from the BHP family to yours, thank you. I'm very grateful to the Chamber for this opportunity to introduce Mayor Charlie Clark. The Chamber and Mayor Charlie share a similar mandate to make Saskatoon a city of opportunity for all. And we are pleased to be active and participate in this vision. For those who don't know about BHP, we're one of the world's largest mining companies. And today, we have a presence in more than 90 locations around the world and mine everything from iron ore to copper, metallurgical, coal, and nickel. And very, very soon, in two years' time, we'll also be mining potash out of our Jensen mine just a couple of hours east of here. I want to briefly touch on that investment, a $14 billion investment in the Jensen project, which is creating employment, procurement, and training and development programs focused on local and indigenous individuals and businesses. Since 2015, we've also invested over $50 million in donations and, spo and sponsorships in Saskatoon and across the province. This includes investments in the hospitals in Saskatoon, the YWCA, Ronald McDonald House, and the food banks, just to name a few. We're proud that our investments, along with the investments of other business owners here in the room and citizens here, 
is creating a ripple effect to the community of Saskatoon. There is a buzz in this city and this province, and I'm pleased that BHP is part of it. Which brings me to the formal role today, which is to introduce Mayor Charlie Clark. Mayor Charlie was re-elected mayor of Saskatoon in 2020 for a second term with a mandate to build a strong economic future where no one is left behind. I think all of us in the room can say he has achieved this. And I run a mini poll just coming out here to see if he would run again, would he be re-elected? And it was a unanimous yes. So for the contenders in the room, you're lucky that he is not um, running this time around. In his time in this office, like many of us here today, Mayor Charlie has demonstrated his passion and dedication to Saskatoon. And from now on until the end of this term in November, he has committed to building a community where people see each other's strength instead of differences, where families can thrive and children are able to see a future for themselves here in this city. But beyond the many accolades of what Charlie has achieved in his um, two tenures here as a mayor, I think the thing that struck me most when I was chatting to him and his beautiful wife here today, Sarah, um, was how they personify everything that I've come to love about this city. They're kind, they're generous, they're hardworking, they're funny and witty, they don't take themselves too seriously, but more importantly, they have golden values of integrity, family, and doing what is right. So with that, I would like to all joining me in a big round of applause in welcoming His Worship, Mayor Charlie Clark. Sarah told me I had to explain why I'm wearing a t-shirt. And it, it says, listen to your city. It's one of my favorite mayor t-shirts. And uh, in case people can't read it, and I decide I get to go casual because I got nothing to lose here. So, I'm, And I'm dressed like a banker because I'm with the Chamber of Commerce, so I have nothing to lose here. Thank you for doing this. This is great. You'll notice that the title is um, Unfiltered and Unplugged. We went through all the acronyms, unhinged felt like the wrong word. <laughs> so we stuck with unfiltered and unplugged, but you're totally right, this is your last one. And so uh, it was an opportunity to change this up. Instead of a, a speech or a presentation, we thought we would do a fireside chat. No fire. Um, but this looks and feels a lot like the chats we've had over the last 18 years. Except we have microphones and there's 300 people here. But, um, it is, nice, it is nice to do this format because I think it's an opportunity to talk a little off script about um, the current state of the city and where you see it going uh, as you go to your next chapter. So um, let's just get right into it. Can I just quickly mention, I want to really thank uh, Harry, Elder Lafon, for his opening words. And I, it was intentional for me um, to ask him he actually got snowed out from doing uh, an opening at a, city, at a state of the city a couple of years ago. But uh, when I think of somebody who has helped me in really, really hard times to sort of see the big picture and, and think about things through um, the humanity of people and, 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 uh, and the relationships involved in trying to um, find a way forward in a city, Harry has just been tremendous. And the work he mentioned about the circles with other mayors is leadership that he's providing across the country, working with Michelle um, and uh, Lyndon Linklater, we were kind of, uh, along with other mayors, uh, looking at how to help foster that uh, 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 environment right across uh, with the mayors of Edmonton, Calgary, Halifax, Regina, um, and, and uh, other leaders across the, the country. So thank you very much, Harry. And thank you, Karina, for that lovely uh, introduction. And, and from such a short time here, you sort of capture the essence of our community so well. And I really appreciate the support of BHP, too. Those are my inter introductory remarks. Yeah. So let's, OK, well, here's the million dollar question. Um, uh, how's the state of the city? <laughs> Yeah. How, how are we doing, Mr. Clark, based on well, where you sit? I have a few pictures for this one, actually. Um, and uh, I wanted 
uh, I knew this was one of the questions to ask. And so take a look at this picture. This is our city. This is actually one year ago on the night my son graduated uh, from high school and we were just down there taking grad picks and went over and this is what was happening at River Landing. I was there last week. It looked very similar. We are now a city of 300,000 people that is setting the bar for uh, urban prairie living. The, we're a, now this community, through the hard work and uh, of so many people in this room, is setting a, a real standard uh, of, of what this can be like. And it was meant, Regina was mentioned by Harry earlier. We had the same year, we had a meeting with the Regina City Council last year uh, at the Besbro, and, uh, and they had been to the gallery and they'd been downtown and everything, and they actually said, okay, you guys won. <laughs> you, got, you got it. And uh, remember, some of our councillors were there, and uh, so that's congratulations to, uh, to everybody uh, here, and, and it, it, I think we're really on the cusp of becoming a bigger city with those kind of experiences. And so you look at, and this picture is the FIBA 3x3 tournament that happened over the course of three years where we're, this is what the world saw about our city. And then you look at the, the, this is one of my absolute favorite places in the city, the outdoor basketball court with the survivor circle in the middle, envisioned by Michael Linklater, Michael Donauer, Marcus Story, indigenous and non-indigenous young leaders in our community. I was just there looking at it last night. It's absolutely incredible. Next slide. This is where we fit in the province. So this is employment growth index. Uh, the green dark line is what Saskatoon's employment growth index has looked like since in the last 10 years. And the gray line is the rest of the province. So when we say we're driving the economy of the province, we, this is a reality. And, the, and, that, and look at what happened around 1819. It really started to divide and our role became even more important. And so we take that seriously and we, we need to continue to work to, to play that role to create opportunity for everyone. Another point I want to make is, uh, and building on what uh, Harry said, we're beginning the journey of reconciliation. And uh, I think this is a really key part of the, where the state of the city is at. There's been a lot of work done, you know, and, and back in 1988 when Harry was, was the chief of Muskeg, like he didn't mention that, but he was the chief who signed the first urban reserve agreement in the country. Uh, there's been, uh, you know, lots of different organizations and groups leaning in now to, to figure out what does this work look like. And I think it's a lot more to be done and now to go from land acknowledgements and flag raisings and words to the actions to the commitment of partnerships and to finding what the, the a co-governance model look like um, this is our 10th urban reserve agreement that was signed last year we've got councillors and the chief tamika searson from lac la Ronge indian band um, uh, and city councillors all together um, and this is a something we're very proud that we've been able to move forward and then uh, we've got one of the elements of the state of our city is it's a time of transformational diversity so this photo was taken last summer. It's a Saskatchewan Intercultural Association youth um, <clears throat> a leadership sort of program that they have where they take newcomer youth from uh, who have moved here from across the world and are helping them get oriented to our community. And you think of the, the stories that these kids bring and, and their families bring and they're moving here and these families are kicking the tires of Saskatoon, determining if they have a future here. And I think we can all agree in the last 20 years it has truly changed if you think of the face of our city. And I just want to call your attention on the bottom right hand corner, there's a, wom a young woman holding on with her arms around two little girls. So that, that girl, the older girl, woman, I think she's somewhere, is an Afghani refugee. Uh, from the Marifat school in Afghanistan, and the two little girls are uh, Ukrainian, from Ukrainian refugee families, and look at how they're treating one another. That's, uh, you know, I think says a lot. I, I also found you finally. Uh, I was looking for your face in this yeah. mix. I'm blocking um, the queen. So you and Liz are in the back, I guess, yeah. and then everybody else is in the front. Sorry. Sorry, Queen. Sorry. Sorry. Maybe it yeah. was two years ago, because I forget when that that. Uh, That's quite a happened. crowd. But That's we. Awesome. Um, so, 
Harry, uh, one of the teachings he, he gave me about a community uh, when we were signing the 30-year uh, recognition of the Urban Reserve Agreement, he talked in a pipe ceremony about how do we build a city where people see strength in one another, especially in diversity. And, and to me, that goes beyond anti-racism, that goes beyond tolerating one another or building a multicultural society. It means how do you create a community when we have this diversity that you see strength in one another. And I wanted to put this slide up to say, this is the other side of the city. I've, I've just talked about some of the amazing things that are happening and the positive things. And we just had a press conference yesterday. Chief McBride is here. I don't know if Acting Chief McLeod is here. Pamela Golden McLeod is here about the reality that we have some significant challenges that we're facing that I wish it felt like we're getting better when it comes to addictions, homelessness, and increased weapons on the street and the impacts that that's having on families, on overdose deaths, on people. Uh, and also on businesses and neighborhoods. Um, and so this is a really important thing, uh, a part of, of what we're grappling with right now as a city. So that's a snapshot of the current situation from your chair. What about the future? If, you are, if you're looking in your crystal ball here, what do you think are the big things, the, the big issues, the big opportunities that are, that are ahead of us? Got a couple of slides on All this right, one Charlie too. Clark. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> half PowerPoint will travel. All right, here we go. These are just a few headlines. You know, I think we heard from BHP, and we know and we see the signs of what's happening. The, what we have in this province is what the world increasingly needs, is demand. And you know, we had record population growth last year: 15,000 people moving here, and also 8,500 jobs being created. Um, and, and that continued growth. So I think we have every reason to believe we have the fundamentals that are going to drive the economy in, into the future. At the same time, I want to assert that we also need to make do the work to uh, address the climate challenge. And if we're going to be successful as a community in the future, uh, we need, and I'm proud of the work we've done as a council, to, uh, to look at what steps can we take to make an energy transition. And this is the, what, what the solar um, uh, project that we have uh, adjacent to Circle Drive. It's a rendering of what it's going to look like, but we are, uh, have it, actually it's on the city council agenda to build all three phases next a month. When I talk to companies about where they're going to invest uh, and, and what they're asking for, if they want to invest here, they want to know that we have a, a, a renewable energy stream that they can use as part of their supply chain. And, uh, and we also know it's already getting smoke in the air, and it's only May because of wildfire season. These are the realities that we're going to have to face. So these are a couple of the big factors, I'd say, in terms of where we're going, how do we address that. Then we also have this unbelievable list of projects and, and, um, that are coming up that people have been working extremely hard on. And so this, we know, is if you just look out the window, that's what uh, is being proposed for the downtown event and entertainment district. We, this facility, this convention center, is not able to hold the conferences and the events and the national and international events that a city of 300,000 people deserves and should be able to host. And uh, we know that uh, the Sastel Center is going to have to be replaced. And there's been an unbelievable amount of work done to bring this vision to life. We're going to have a big discussion about the costs and how we're going to pay for it coming up here. Along with that is the library, which to me is going to be a, a, a transformational project. And if anybody has doubts or questions of that, go to Halifax, go to Calgary, go to Winnipeg to see what, what their uh, renovated library looks like and how it's creating a buzz in their community. This is, uh, we hope, shovels in the ground on the library this year. The bus rapid transit. If you're a city of 300,000 people, you need to be able to move people uh, efficiently. We had 12.5 million rides last year and an 18% increase in transit ridership. Our big challenge right now is not enough buses and buses being over full. And, um, and so this is, and we've got the investments now from the provincial and federal governments to start building this this year. There's another project is the moving uh, SAS Polytech uh, to the innovation place and creating the innovation corridor that uh, will be something like we've never seen, no city has in the country, but to, to combine something like innovation place with a polytechnic campus 
a uh, U15 uh, comprehensive university um, and linking it to the downtown to create the links into uh, the entrepreneurial community is going to be a, a profound, a, a transformational and profound change for our, our city. You know what I love about this photo? Just go oh. back. That's a high tech looking building. But there's tractors in the parking lot in the lower right-hand side. I'm sure they're self-driving tractors. Uh, they must drive themselves. <laughs> okay. They might even fly, I I for all we know. <laughs> Just fly up across the city and land in the farmer's field. And we're, yeah. So this is huge. Wanaskewin is, is, gonna, uh, is making a bid for UNESCO heritage status, and, and that is going to help bring this incredible park and, and site into uh, the eyes of the world. And we also have the National Urban Park. And all the pictures we had of that are just the existing Miwasan Valley, which um, we know and love. Uh, but having a National Urban Park in this city is also going to be transformational. So just take a minute to think about all those projects together. And in 15 years, if they come to pass, what kind of city we will be and what that offers for the world and to our children and grandchildren growing up here. It is quite amazing and that's all as a result of a lot of people's hard work and, and vision to do something profound here. That's most of my slideshow. If we can get back to okay. chit chat now. No, it's very good. I mean, you, you look at, there's a lot of things going on and it's, it's sometimes, uh, it's almost dizzying, right? It's like a lot of white noise. It's just uh, there's a thousand big projects, new initiatives, opportunities, whatever. It's nice to get a little synopsis like that. So thank you for that. Um, take us into your conversation with the new mayor on his or her first day. What should be priority one in light of everything you've talked about? Um, and what pitfalls should he or she be aware of? All right, so we might even have people who might run for mayor in the room here, but um, my... All those running for mayor, please, <laughs> no. We, we had one of those luncheons, we're not doing it again, I'll tell you. <laughs> That's right. Um, that, was, that was a very impactful moment. Anyway, so, uh, here's my message. Build your team and build relationships with the people around you. Uh, because we are living in times when you do not know what uh, crisis or curveball that is going to get thrown at you. And if you don't r uh, remember that uh, you're just part of a group, part of a team, um, and to have people that you can trust uh, in tough times, but also people who trust you. Uh, those challenges are going to be much more difficult. And I can tell you, I have had, when I first became elected as mayor, I thought, I'm the mayor. I'm supposed to have all the answers. I'm supposed to be the one to kind of like make the decisions and know how to go through. And then things come up and you realize you do not have the answers and you don't know what to do. And working with this council, I can think of so many times when we've faced challenging situations. We've had some come up even in the last week. Um, that I think, I don't know what to do here. And then we'll go into a council meeting, and along with, we've got this great team of our se senior administration with Jeff and uh, the, the team here, council members here, um, and, and, I th and I think, I don't know what the path is. And then we come out of a meeting, and we've found a path, because we've listened to each other, we, and it doesn't matter if people are more on the left of the spectrum, more on the right of the spectrum, when you really rely and build that trust with each other, that is critical. And I have this amazing team here, Michelle, Shelley Berkey, Jay, who's at the back, um, Anna, who's not here, and Char, who's not with us now, Jordan from the last round from the mayor's office, who I have come in devastated on days where I'm just overwhelmed, and they have guided me through the, uh, so many things. So don't get the illusion that you uh, have to have all the answers or that you shouldn't invest in those relationships around you. And I see people who do that. They think they're gonna be the king and they, and they kind of treat, take people for granted. I guess that's the pitfalls. Um, don't let the name your worship go to your head. <laughs> and I'm serious. I always thought that was weird. Did you think that was weird? Yes, I still don't understand the I mean, origins of it. little sash that. and the whole thing. I mean, it's just, it looks like you're going to, you know, there should be trumpets, you know. Ba -ba -ba -ba! His worship, Charlie, Cl you know, and it's like, look at, this is a Legion Hall. Like, there's 30 people here for a state but I've night. Got my I don't know scissors. if we need the whole thing, but 
I think that's weird. So, Sorry, I just thought I'd add that. To and there's a real risk that as you get called your worship more and more, your head starts to expand and you start to think you're more important than other people. And, uh, and then you start treating people like you're more important than other people. And then if you do that, and instead of recognizing that your job in reality, if you want to be successful over four years or beyond, when all the curveballs come up, your job is to lift people up. Because there's times... Yep. There's, there's times when you need to be lifted up and because you don't know what to do. And, and the bourbon isn't working. No. There's no comfort. The team's doing what they can do and the bourbon isn't working and now you need something else. I so can. that includes... Your colleagues on council, your, team, your incredible team at the administration, who sometimes I see people not even knowing the names of their staff or not even knowing, uh, you know, it, whether it's in an organization or a corporation. Um, there are, you, you need to be able to build that trust around you and not, not get it in your head that you're the most important. The other one piece of pitfall I would say is don't stay stuck in your uh, office or in your meeting rooms at City Hall get out and go out into the community. The biggest learnings I've had have been when I've ridden the bus or when I've gone on a ride along with the police service or when I did the 36-hour uh, homeless challenge and went out and actually got to know and talk to the uh, incredible people who are out there living on the streets and, re you know, reminded that they're not statistics and they're not headlines. These are individuals who have stories to tell and understand or the, those kids in that in that I you know got to spend time with in that um, from the newcomer program or all of those things it you can let the job just suck you away from the, the real life of the community don't do that because you'll miss out on the insights and the wisdom that are needed to, uh, to to really truly be there for people when they when they're needed I want to ask you look we're going to get into issues in a minute here but <clears throat> I want to ask you about this could be my perception, but sort of the tone of political discourse. That it, it seems, it feels like there's, a, there's growing incivility in politics um, and political discourse. And that must, that's changed since when you started, uh, like as a counselor many moons ago. And it's not just the way that politicians communicate with each other, which is lacking in civility, but of course social media makes it easy for people to attack community leaders personally and often anonymously. And that's got to be a, a big change. So my question to you is, how has that changed the way elected officials approach the job and make decisions? Well, I remember when I first started in 2006, Glenn Penner was one of uh, the early mentors, you know, as a counselor, been a long time. And, and I had my Blackberry, he didn't bother with that. Um, and we didn't have any social media, we didn't have, you know, the, none of that existed. So that's one of the reasons I think I was able to stay elected because there was no high school photos of me or any of that stuff online because that didn't exist. He talked about, he started, they had a binder with seven pages in it and they go through how many wheelbarrows to buy in the budget, uh, you know, because he started. So fast forward to today, um, it has changed a lot, and, uh, and I'm glad you asked this question, and he, he told me some of the questions he was going to ask, but I prepared for this one because I've been talking about divisiveness and some of those things, and, and I actually think it runs deeper than that, and it has to do with the decisions leaders make about how we are going to respond in these times, because people are living in times of uncertainty and fear, and there's a lot of reasons for that, and I think COVID was a real accelerator of this sense of where are we going to go and how are we going to move forward. And uh, we also live in a time when people are now living on completely different information uh, uh, worlds, where you don't source the news or information from the same place, so you're in you know, you're like in islands in a, in a, in a society. And I, the, the key to me is leaders, whether it's political leaders or leaders in all society, have to decide what do you do in the face of that reality. Fear and people 
increasingly divided. And I am very concerned that what we're seeing more and more in politics is the politics of blame. In the face of that, you, you, you just apply blame to other people. And to be honest, the politics of blame, and this is an example, I'm not trying to call out anybody in specific because I think it falls across different lines, but this is just a headline from last week. Blame Justin Trudeau for the city's murders, right? It's sensational, it gets you fueled up, and it, and it deepens that sense that we're in islands in the face of very complex issues. And to be honest, blame is lazy, it's easy, and it doesn't have courage. Think if you're in a company that's going through a hard time, or a family that's going through a hard time, and you're facing some challenges, and you go to your boss and you say, man, we are facing some challenges, what are we gonna do with this? And the boss just says, oh, it's because of that person, and that person, and that person, that's why everything's going bad. Would you feel like, oh, that's giving me reassurance that we're going to be able to get through the climate crisis, the economic crisis, the wars that are going on, you know, the, the, the work of reconciliation? I would say Harry's vision of a society is the one that we need to be thinking about, not the, what we hear and see more often. The problem is, is blame is powerful because it does, in, it, it fuels something in people. So for our community, let's, let's hold up people and, and approaches that continue, because everything I showed you that has been, is incredible about our community was done because people didn't focus on blame, they focused on what's gonna create a good community for, for, uh, for the future. Um, and so I think that this is uh, a really critical piece that we need to make sure that uh, we, we keep building here. So um, that's my thoughts on the whole issue of, uh, incivility and the risk that it, it's running for, for our society. And I've asked you many times over coffees and beers and stuff um, how you deal with the onslaught of sometimes really personal criticism on, on legitimate issues, sure, but it does pivot to blame and other things. And you've always said that you would, you seek out opportunities like that riverbank photo, right? You go dive back into what normal community looks like instead of, you know, Facebook and Twitter, which is the hellscape of the internet, right? So there are ways to cope with it. Yeah. Actually, I'll just and quote, bourbon. I'll just quote, <laughs> I was listening to an interview with Marilyn Robinson, who's a author of Gilead and Lila and a, and a bunch of books, and she's just a fascinating person. She said when she was in high school, um, or one of her teachers said, you're going to be stuck with your mind your whole life. So you need to fill it with, or so you want to make sure it's a mind that you want to live with. And in order to have a mind that you want to live with, you need to fill it with things that are, make you feel good, make you feel hopeful, make you feel positive. And, uh, and she talks about poetry and relationships and family and joy and all of those different things. And so um, that just popped into my head when you said that. And it's not an escape from the criticism. And those are realities. But I also know that the criticism, because I, yes, I'm the target of all kinds of anger. If I go online and read comments of news articles, it's, it's a hard thing to, to do sometimes. But I also recognize that we're living in a time when people are in these bubbles and they're anxious and they're putting their... I remember in... <laughs> Back when I was a city councillor, around this time of year, like end of April, I would just get this, uh, these calls and emails of people like, when is my street going to start? And these streets are like a third world country. And, and, and I realized, oh yeah, it's spring. Everybody's gone through the winter. And you're just ready for the, the good feeling of, of summer, but the streets look like crap. And we were not doing nearly as well of street sweeping as we are now, because uh, our team has done an incredible job of improving upon that. But sometimes people just let out that uh, frustration at the closest person they can, and the mayor is an obvious target. So I don't take, try not to take that personal, but I also try not to direct it towards somebody else. And, uh, and that's, I think, the key. I want to talk about crime and safety because it's top of mind. And um, actually, we should take the opportunity. Uh, is our new police chief 
Cam McBride here. Cam, are you here? Cam, would you stand up and just let's acknowledge uh, this great new appointment. Congratulations, Cam. I think the commission did a good job. I think people are excited and hopeful. Uh, it was a very McBride. thorough process, and this gentleman rose to the top and it's, with uh, glowing colors. It was uh, it's great to see her. And given all the change we're going through as a city, as we, as we establish a fire chief and as we go through an election, we know that that much changes a lot for a community. So I'm so glad to have Cam there in, as, as the foundation. Yeah, continuity is very important. So crime and safety, this is going to be a big file. And so uh, we're hearing, we've, we're reading, Saskatoon is on track to break the record for homicides in our city, which was set in 2019, and that was uh, 16. We're at nine homicides now. Uh, violent crime rates, according to media, are growing to levels we haven't experienced before. What's the best approach to fight back and ultimately prevent violent crime from escalating much further? Well, the reason we held the press conference yesterday uh, was because we know whenever you see those headlines and you hear about incidents and we have transit drivers describing how challenging it can be on transit buses or the library closing its hours early, uh, you know, because they're facing situations they just haven't seen. This is tricky. This is very concerning because there's behaviors and, and, um, and people who are out there in that desperate state um, uh, and with more weapons creating these, these, these situations. Um, and uh, so we also, as discussed, are uh, in a place where we're seeing more coordination and collaboration on, in terms of how to address it and with the municipal services, fire and police and our city staff um, than we've seen before. And, uh, and that's going to be key. We'll have 18 additional uniformed officers on the street thanks to the last budget, which was a bit of a tough budget to to get through, and I, we talked quite a bit about that, Jason, back in the day. Um, and, uh, but to try to make sure we have resources available on that end, the 15-bed complex needs shelter that the province is committed to opening up is, we hope, on stream within the next few weeks. Uh, we're going to be having reports about how we make sure we can drive forward with this whole-of-city approach tomorrow at the Governance and Priorities Committee meeting. I don't have a silver bullet answer to, to how, and, and when, every time the big city mayor's caucus gets together, every city is right now grappling with this. But we know that people are falling through the cracks. We do not have enough treatment supports in place. We do not have enough supportive housing in place. We have people who don't have hope and, uh, and very addictive, very cheap drugs that are, are becoming uh, a distraction. We need to keep treating people as human beings. I don't want us to think, well, violence equals homelessness, so then everybody we see out there struggling on the street, we need to pull further back from and not see their humanity. That's something that the... A uh, 36-hour challenge reminded me. Everybody has a story, and we together need to how, figure out how to build a, society, a community and a society where they're supported. We also need to support the organizations that are out there trying to support people right now because they're exhausted, whether it's the Tribal Council and the in incredible work they've been doing with uh, not just the Wellness Center, but the outreach programs they have and the supportive housing program. The Salvation Army has been full, and they opened up an overnight warming center that has, uh, was just a lifesaver, but very challenging, also addressing violent situations. Um, you know, we, we have uh, the Métis community and Comfy has been providing supports right there on 20th Street as well as uh, housing and supports for many people. And whenever you start listing organizations, you risk leaving people out. But there's so many different uh, organizations that are exhausted, including the transit workers and the library staff that are having to do things they never uh, had to do before, and the emergency workers like fire, police, and ambulance that are out there on the street dealing, dealing with these things. So we need to be as coordinated as possible, and we need to fix the gaps in the continuum of care, including not have so many barriers to getting on social assistance. That's a, still a big problem, the changes that happen with the CIS program that haven't been fixed yet. Um, but we're going to keep working with the province, building those solutions, and, um, and, and uh, uh, trying to make the community safe for everybody. I want to talk about that, that sort of provincial component for a second, because it's not unusual, uh, certainly in Saskatchewan, for a majority of the provincial cabinet, certainly the caucus, um, 
you know, it's comprised mainly of rural-based MLAs, rural-based policymakers, and so that scenario is likely to play out again. What do we need to What do we need to do to keep urban Saskatoon or urban Saskatchewan on the agenda for folks who may not be living and breathing these challenges in in neighborhoods or commercial districts like we are? Well, um, I actually have one picture for this, and. Uh, so the rural-urban divide is a real risk uh, in our province, and that the sense that uh, you know the different realities of rural and urban. And I'm glad Reeve Harwood is here because uh, we have uh, worked a lot, uh, along with uh, Randy Donauer, has been uh, involved in, on the in this regional growth planning uh, as in a leadership role in council to um, at least within our region build those channels of dialogue and partnership. Um, to recognize that our future is intertwined. Uh, you know, the jobs and the economic opportunity and, and the activities of our city are very much driven by so much of the, of the um, activities uh, and economic activities in the whole province. And as, as Harry said earlier, our city is a place that is a second home for, for so many people across uh, the province. And uh, I am worried in an election that you end up with uh, increasingly gov a government that doesn't have that urban representation uh, strongly established, especially as noted, the role we're playing in the economy. In order to keep uh, creating a city that people are gonna wanna live in and, and, um, and is gonna be able to continue to create those opportunities, you need to have provincial and federal governments investing. We can't build all of those things without uh, an understanding by other orders of government that you need to keep investing in cities and you can't do it with the tax base you have relying on property taxes. Um, and so it's going to be very important, whoever gets elected in the next provincial government, that they understand we're not trying to say give the city more and give rural areas less. We're trying to say, how do we build both wings of this plane so this province can continue to thrive into the future, but also recognize, because one of the points we made yesterday, when it comes to some of our services, we, we are becoming a service center, a destination or the la place of last resort for many people in, in rural areas that are, um, who have addictions issues, who have, uh, in some cases, complex needs issues or even behavioral challenges that don't have any uh, services in their community and they end up in Saskatoon and, they, and, and, uh, and it's, that's another strain on our local organizations that are not only trying to meet the needs of the local community but also increasingly uh, from across the province, and so we need the help to play that role. Our healthcare system's backed up, our schools are, are backed up. We need to be investing in, in a city like this that's growing. We need the provincial government to really understand that. We talked a little bit, well, we talked quite a bit about reconciliation, and it's been a, an ongoing process for our community. It's one that, of course, it's a journey, it's not a destination. We're gonna be doing this for a long time. Um, it's been a priority for you. Harry spoke very eloquently about it. Um, lots been set in motion, but there's a lot that remains to be done. Um, what's your sense of our city's progress on the reconciliation front? Well, uh, you know, the, the t having 10 urban reserves and, and having organizations like the Chamber who, um, who established the Mastahi Mamechihitoin Award, um, having the, the sort of broad-based commitment and, and steps by different uh, organizations and partners in the community to me is where that, that uh, momentum comes from in, the, in meaningful ways. I see this incredible generation of young entrepreneurs and leaders and uh, lawyers, ed educators, doctors who are First Nations and Métis, who are, are, who are um, really providing so much benefit. Even, like I mentioned, the, the basketball court, Michael Linklater, we wouldn't have it if, if there, that partnership hadn't happened that everybody benefits from as a city as well as First Nations that have growing capacity, and they're uh, looking uh, with, with more and more strategic approaches at how to invest some of the settlements that they have in opportunities. That's creating jobs for everybody. It's creating investment for everybody in our community. Um, and so we are going to need to uh, keep building that path and make sure more and more of the people who are struggling can see some, some form of hope uh, in our community and, and, to, and to build it forward. And so I think it's going to need to, so the, 
You've taken the step of the award. What's the next step? You know, for each organization uh, to say, what is the next step that we take in terms of building that shared partnership that is the opposite of a colonial approach, which has been so harmful in the past, where, where the non-Indigenous community had a, a feeling of inferiority and uh, used policy and, and uh, other ways to, to enforce it. That's been trained into the non-Indigenous community, that we've been trained to have that, the, that racism. And if we're going to change that, we need to recognize where that, those inherent biases have been built up in us and learn to see strength in one another, as Harry said. And to, because what I am seeing more and more is there are teachings within um, the First Nations and Métis uh, worldview that can help us to build a stronger society where we all uh, uh, can have meal wakoto uh, and uh, good relationships, where it's, we're not so selfish and we're not so focused on our own individual needs, but uh, or, or even lonely. Uh, but we focus more on on how, what does it mean to have a community. Meal um, wachetowin is a principle of not just having good relationships, but each of us acting in focusing on our good relationships with everyone out of the understanding that if everybody is focused on good relationships, then that creates a stronger network of relationships to lift everybody up. I think that's the opposite of the divisiveness in some of those things. I think we can learn from that in addition to uh, an understanding of what is the path to live in a more sustainable relationship with the land. And and because uh, we know that path is not looking good if we don't uh, turn around uh, some of the uh, practices that we've had. And we're going to only do it one step at a time, but it can help us find a better future for the generations to grow up here. So I just encourage us to all commit and recognize this isn't just an obligation, it's something that can be a very positive thing for our, our future. Let's talk deed, which oh my, we got to find a different name for this thing. Deed is not super inspiring, but we'll get there. But the groundwork's been laid. You, um, you showed us some pictures of you know, what it could be. The vision is there. Um, the economic impact has been calculated. Uh, the chamber in downtown Saskatoon did that work and you know, over a billion dollar boost to this economy downtown and everything that would happen around it. What remains to be seen is the price tag and how we're gonna pay for it. And so that's coming in June, July. I'm looking over at those guys because you're checking out. Just July? No, I'm just kidding. July. It's going to come in July. So it's going to be a big number. You weren't, you weren't kidding. It's going to be a big number. And we're going to have to get really creative in terms of how we finance this thing. How confident are you in the plan that's coming together? Well, I'm, I'm confident in th that it's not meant to be the gold-plated plan. It's, it's, it's a plan of what we need to have a successful uh, um, uh, district and, and, to, and to replace these existing facilities, and it's going to be expensive. And um, there are lots of examples of these districts that have been um, able to source and use a, a whole range of different revenue sources to pay for them uh, without... Uh, having to rely on, on big property tax increases, which to me is not the right way to pay for it, and, uh, and I think it would, would be a very challenging path forward. I think it's probably going to have to happen in phases, realistically, and, um, and uh, it's going to come down to building that shared vision. We're really anxious to see what a private partner can bring to the table because uh, we've seen some examples of very significant investments by private partners, even in places like Hamilton and, and uh, Palm Springs and areas that aren't, don't have professional team, sports teams um, at the level of the NHL or the NBA. Um, it's going to be heavy lifting for the next council, I know that. And uh, it's going to require investments by the province and require investments by the federal government and it require legislative changes um, in order for it to happen. Uh, but we also think about that idea of what do we want to be in 20 years, what are we going to be just in terms of our population if we just reach 300,000 and is the status quo going to serve that? Um, and, uh, and we are going to need to make changes in order to, or in order to continue to make sure that the whole province can experience these kind of world-class events and, and experiences that they've been able to enjoy now. Okay, so July. We'll wait on July. Let's talk transit. Um, so transit, um, investments in transit are always a tough sell. And um, 
Saskatoon continues to hover around, you know, a, a relatively low ridership. I don't exactly, I think you, sorry, what percentage did you say? Four? Four percent. Okay, so four percent of the population active transit users. Um, and in spite of, you know, dropping fares for children and incentivizing post-secondary students, you know, the ridership is sort of hovering there. Um, is the business case for investing in transit getting stronger with talk around things like the downtown entertainment district and the need to get workers to every corner of the city? Well, the 4% is actually before we had this 18% jump uh, last year. And, and again, I think what we are facing is as the city continues to grow um, and, and we're seeing a lot more people who are turning to transit as, as the, uh, a key way of getting around, whether it's in the newcomer community or people who have arrived here or students. Um, we're hearing from the university and high school students a lot. Um, we're not going to be able to continue to expand the city and not have significant traffic problems because we, we're not going to be able to make 8th Street wider. We're not going to be able to make College Drive wider or 22nd Street or Attridge uh, <coughs> which, or Preston, which are where we're seeing bottlenecks now. We have to create more efficient transit, make it be able to be more competitive with driving. And uh, that's what's huge about the bus rapid transit network is that it's been in, we've got the investments from the provincial and federal governments. It took four years of battling to get that there. They're gonna start building this year. We're gonna see some of those changes in place. And, um, and uh, whether we even move to autonomous vehicles or whatever it might be, you're going to need the right of way to, uh, to be able to uh, have people m be moved, not just individually in, in one car. That's, what, cause we've, that's one reason we've heard, well, transit's not gonna make sense because of autonomous vehicles and things. It's still about geometry and road space and moving people more efficiently. And I believe that uh, given where we're at as a city and where we're going, it's going to become even more important. And that 300,000 is often a tipping point where you need those bigger transit systems. Related to that, and it's not on our thing, but I'm going to ask you. I want to talk active transportation. Of course you do. Bike wanna, lane, Charlie. But, <laughs> it, right. Like, Mine it until of he's all gone. of the things to... <laughs> Of, uh, I, I never understood, you maybe can play this back to me, I've never understood why, uh, like, a, a, you know, cycling or bike lane or act, j j just generates this, like, I don't know, it's like an incendiary, it just, it's a reaction, and I don't, and then you get labeled with it, you know. Are you surprised by that? Like, when you, when you... Well, you tell me why that's the issue. Well, I, mean, I don't I'm, have a problem. I, don't, with it. I can't. I haven't figured out the but psychology I mean, every, of just, that one. Just introducing the idea has been a challenge since you started, and it became kind of a thing. And you know, um, have we turned the corner? Do you think on this conversation? Like, do, do you think we can? Are we starting to get to a place as a community where we're starting to understand how an active transportation network can work? It can be affordable, it can be attractive, it can be accessible, all those wonderful things. Or are we still at a point where we're going to have to have some big talks about it? I, I, I feel like we're making some progress, and, and there's been some pretty key reports and decisions, including some coming to council, um, that, that didn't feel quite as contentious um, uh, just in the last month or so. Um, it's tragic, but the death of Natasha Fox... Um, it was something that was very, uh, and Darren uh, also, um, whose last name has just has, uh, gone out of my brain, but uh, who was uh, killed over on Avenue P, has brought us to light that this isn't a silly political wedge issue, um, but this is a, uh, an issue of there are people who get around by uh, not just vehicles, and the more we can create safe conditions for everyone, because you don't want to be a driver that hits a pedestrian or a cyclist just as much as you don't want to be the pedestrian or cyclist. Um, and so uh, it's, it's something that I think is causing more of that reflection. I really admire our staff, have really worked hard to try to bring facts and, um, and best practices uh, to forward in this city um, and counselors who have to navigate this. I think one of the really key things is that it can't be all on council to convince everybody that the Oh, oh. Um, <laughs> the chamber staff just killed the mic right there. <laughs> we, we need voices like the chamber. <laughs> Kill it. <clears throat> Kill it. 
like, you know, uh, the business community to, to help deep, depolarize this issue and, and, and help us. Are we wanting to be a big city with, with uh, good ways of getting around for everyone or are we going to just get stuck in this pickup truck versus car kind of idea that that's, that's what this comes down to? Because there's definitely enough room for everybody on our streets. We just uh, need to be able to make those choices or make those investments. And, um, and we're making some, some progress and I hope we've turned a corner. So for making elbow room on, on existing streets, uh, there's a lot of conversation around housing, housing density. Uh, we hear it all the time. Um, the members of the chamber who are in major growth mode or hiring mode, you know, they're worried about the ability to attract people uh, because one of the selling points that they had for decades was our affordability. And we're still, we're still affordable we're relative to other places, but it's getting more expensive. So what do we got to do here to densify the city and there's this housing accelerator fund that was announced by the feds and we've signed on to it it seems like most cities have jumped at it because it is it's money and it's coming from on high uh, and the goal is to speed up that development but what what was catching everybody's attention was you know permitting up to four units on residential sites four-story development along rapid transit, removing parking requirements, et cetera, et cetera. So if I live in Lakeview, am I gonna wake up tomorrow and, and there's gonna be a fourplex next door, right? Um, what, what are your thoughts on, on this? And more importantly, what does this mean for our, our home builders? Um, will these changes actually result in the reduction of red tape and maybe other barriers to actually getting developments off the ground? What do you think? One of the first things I ever dealt, met Jason was back on the Broadway 360 plan. Remember that? To find the right balance to have the right kind of development guidelines for Broadway under whether it was this question of are we going to just have big buildings everywhere and, and, um, and uh, overwhelm the single family homes. So this, this recent development is it's new territory for us. The federal government is sort of really mandating that if cities want to be part of, uh, of getting this funding, that we need to, to open the door for better, uh, for um, the ability to build four units on any lot or the four story developments. Our staff are working very hard right now towards reports in June that will come to council um, where to, to find within that sort of larger directive what's the right way to have a balance and make sure that you don't, somebody who's living on a, on a, in a, on a single family lot in a house doesn't have a, uh, a, just a huge wall built up beside them you know, with something that's very different, while at the same time, some level of change so that we can bring more density into the existing streets. And we've talked about that this is the most efficient way to build a city is to allow where you already have streets, infrastructure, all of those things, rather than continually adding new, uh, new infrastructure that's built and then has to be maintained, uh, let's build density. And uh, I do believe that allowing for more of that, uh, those opportunities, especially the smaller units that can be the student housing or can be for seniors who want to downsize or for those the, the options within a neighborhood is a good model. Kelowna has been doing it for five years. Uh, Minneapolis has been doing it for even longer and they've found that it uh, has facilitated uh, that kind of development. And so um, it's going to be a, a, a pretty um, contentious. We got some big issues coming for the last two months of this council. Uh, everybody, I think, is preparing for it, whether it's the deed or these housing accelerator fund discussions or how are we going to address some of the homelessness out in our community. Um, but I think we can't just keep being attached to the single family neighborhood uh, without any change model. And I live in Utana. That is a neighborhood that has all kinds of housing where, where there have been areas where single family homes were replaced by small apartments, condos, duplexes, row houses. And now that they're there, it's actually, it's a great neighborhood that has uh, student housing. It has people who are newcomers who are living there. It has families that are renting. It has seniors. And um, uh, it can be done in a way that, that does facilitate those outcomes. Let's talk business attraction and investment. Um, so. You know, we, we always are talking about incentives and, and ways to, you know, incentivize companies to get bigger here, but also to relocate here from other places. And um, do we, from your point of view, if, if you had another four years on council, what else would you do 
to incentivize uh, business attraction and investment? Well, I remember when I ran for mayor in 2016 and Michelle and I were meeting with the home builders and uh, the home builders, uh, it was um, David uh, from Northridge, whose last name just escaped me, um, who said, you know, what we're, he was the chair of the Home Builders Association and he said, what we need right now is, uh, is certainty, collaboration and a level playing field between the city and the industry and that made sense to me and so we worked very hard to, to build and streamline some programs and and uh, and to uh, be able to make sure that we weren't having unnecessary red tape in the way or a feeling that uh, that there wasn't consistency in how we were applying rules and and, um, and and committed to having the fastest building permit turnaround time in the country and I'm proud to say last year Got another slide. Um, the, uh, there was a the Canadian Home Builders Association did a municipal benchmarking uh, report. This was done nationally, and Saskatoon is the second best uh, in terms of our approval timelines and our rank uh, in the country um, as a result of incredible work again by our staff. Kara Fangyu is the director in the area who, who and, and Leslie Anderson played a big role. Lynn LaCroix, who's leaving us next month, has been absolutely critical to this along with uh, Jeff. And, um, uh, and so that's the same thing we are gonna do. In the last budget, we talked a lot about how, do, how does the community know that we're getting value for our, the money that's invested through taxes, especially when we're facing tax increases and things. And we've committed to doing value for money audits and looking at are there ways within our different departments that we can continue to, to be utilize technology, best practices, you know, to, to become more efficient. Tomorrow at the Governance and Priorities Committee meeting, there's a, a report on the ways that we've actually been able to leverage savings through um, uh, some of the technological changes that we've had or through uh, energy savings at our wastewater treatment plant or other things that are really in the millions of dollars. And um, we just, as I said at the beginning, it's all about relationships and not having a hostile relationship where with from city hall to the community or from the council to the community, but, but being open to criticism and hearing where the concerns are and committing to address them. And uh, I'm proud that I think we've made not perfect as a, as a councillor, as a city, but we've made some real progress on that. So I'm conscious of time. We're going to wrap this up. Um, Ten-word answer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that. Oh, yeah, well, um, you're looking back on this time. Biggest achievement. Proudest achievement. Well, I, I feel like establishing a city where young people see a future and where I think we're starting to understand the idea of, of uh, reconciliation and trying to set the tone of being uh, inclusive and, and a city that welcomes one another to me is, to me is uh, something I've worked very hard at and that I, I feel like we haven't completely achieved, but it's the most important thing. We can build everything we want, but if you don't have a city where people trust each other or feel like they have a sense of belonging, um, you're not gonna be able to uh, build a community that you can build a strong future um, and solve the problems you face. So, so that's what stands out. What are you gonna miss? You're gonna miss these rubber chicken dinners. I mean, <laughs> well, Sarah's broken hearted. She just is just torn up. Yeah, no more rubber chicken dinners. I'm gonna love being home for supper with Sarah more often and the kids, that's for sure. Um, just in the last week, I'll try and do this in 10 words. I yesterday had lunch with the staff who helped to put on a round dance for the city, the first ever city of Saskatoon round dance. Then uh, at the end of the last week, we signed with the Bangladeshi community an agreement to put a Shahid Minar monument uh, to International Mother Language Day in Kensington Park. And then I went to Nine Mile and they are opening their new legacy project. Of, I saw you there, uh, you know, this innovation hub. And I also went to the Saskatchewan Association of Chiefs of Police Recognition Night, heard about incredible examples of police leadership in the community. I went to the Globe Walk with the Saskatoon Council on Aging and uh, met with this incredible, well, I've gone there every year because I just love it, but all these seniors that walk 
around the world over and over again through the winter so they can keep connected and get to know each other. And, um, and, it's, uh, and then I also went to the Mady Nation opening of the Early Learning Child Care Center in Kensington. That's one week in the life of a mayor. And that's not everything. So when you see the news and you see how miserable things can seem or you look at Facebook, I, when you're the mayor, you get to go and see the people who are out there not looking for recognition, finding ways to support one another, finding ways to uh, make sure that people can stay active and healthy and, uh, and have good lives here. That is alive and kicking in our community. And I am going to miss the... Ch I'm not going to... I'll be able to go and see those things, but when you're the mayor, you get all the invitations. I don't even get to all of them. And um, it is truly, truly inspiring. Going back to what I said about Marilyn Robinson and filling your mind with things that make you uh, feel hopeful, um, boy, has this experience ever done that for me. Well, as I said off the top, we've met a lot over the years in conversations like this, and we've agreed on a lot. Um, there's been times where I've questioned your viewpoint. Uh, Sometimes your sanity. We had some like um, phone yelling arguments those a are couple good of talks, times along the way. But um, have never questioned your integrity, ever. And ever questioned your reason for being mayor. So we want to thank you for your service. We want to thank you for being unfiltered and unplugged as part of today's uh, big state of the city. All the best to you in the future, okay? Thanks, Jason. Thank you very much, everybody. I'd like to invite Sarah. Elder LaFond, Joe, Karina, to come join us on stage. Mayor Clark, we thought this would be the right occasion to present you with a gift of appreciation for your service to the city of Saskatoon, both on Saskatoon City Council and during your time as mayor. From property taxes to pandemic responses, boulevard gardens to bike lanes, bike lane Charlie, there we go. There was never a shortage of the issues and challenges to discuss. However, through it all, you remain focused and positive on the opportunities facing our city and our potential to be the prairie city that got it right. In that spirit, we would like to present you with this gift as a reminder of your time in office. This is one in a series of promotional posters published by the Saskatoon Board of Trade, which was the chamber's original name, in 1945 to entice investment and new business to the city after the Second World War. It must have worked because since that time, with a few exceptions, Saskatoon has grown and prospered ever since. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, join me in thanking Mayor Charlie Clark for his dedicated service to our city and our community. They'll be up here for our photo ops for a few minutes. I just want to thank you all um, again to our presenting sponsor, BHP, our powerhouse series sponsors, CanProtex, Sask Polytechnic, Graham Construction, Nutrien, and Saskatchewan Blue Cross. And to Elder Harry LaFond, and of course, TCU Place for the delicious meal and wonderful service. For all upcoming events, please watch your email for the Chamber check-in on Wednesdays. And remember to follow the Chamber on social at the Chamber YXE. Thank you all for coming. Take care and have a wonderful day. 
I just want to say thank you to the chamber uh, for all the organizing and, the, and to Jay O'Kranitz, who's at the back, who's really sweated over getting this right. And uh, having both Sarah and Michelle here is uh, really meaningful for me because <laughs> it wouldn't have been possible with so many of you, but these two are just such an, a huge part of this whole experience, so thank you.